Would you please stand and join with me as we sing together hymn number 73, O Worship the King, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5. First of all, it's my privilege to welcome each of you to this time of worship here at the Historic Sardis Methodist Church. Um, and um, if you're worshiping with us for the first time or if you haven't been here for a while, fill out one of the communication cards so I can scribble out a note to you and say uh, how much we uh, enjoyed having you be here and how blessed we are. For those that are worshiping with us via the internet, we uh, welcome you as well. And if you'd like to get a note, if you send it to an email at office at sardischurch.com, I'll write you a note as well. So we look forward to that. Uh, I think uh, those are, oh, one other announcement about communion. Uh, if you'd like to uh, have uh, gluten-free, please let us know when you come to the front. And if you'd rather not do intinction, you can ask the ushers and they can provide you with one of the little kits uh, that come so that... Uh, that we can do that. I think those are all of the announcements. Ah, one more announcement. Remember that uh, next week, this will be noontime. 
So we spring forward. So, so, so remember to reset your clocks uh, uh, to, uh, on Saturday night so that uh, we can all be up bright and early on next Sunday morning. I think those are the only announcements. Am I missing anything? Then let us pray. Most gracious and eternal God, as we come to this time of worship, our prayer is that you would pour out your spirit in this place, that we might feel your presence, that it might warm us as the sun warms us, that being the S-O-N sun who warms us. And Lord, as we lift you up in praise, may we feel the blessings that come down from doing that which you have created us to do, worship you. We ask these things in Christ's name, and God's children all said, Amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me. A sinner condemned unclean We're singing how marvelous How wonderful And my song shall ever be How marvelous How wonderful is my Savior's love Somebody ought to say that. Amen. How wonderful, how marvelous. Uh, if the ushers would please come at this time.
If you'd please remain standing as we go through our communion liturgy. It's on page 12 in the hymn book. In fact, why don't you sit down? Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Hear the good news. Christ died for our sinners while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 The Lord be with you. And also Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. I've asked my wife to join me this morning as we serve communion, so I'm going to ask her to join me at this time. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, 
we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. If you would please come.
prepare for our time of prayer, I would ask that we would just take a moment and be silent as we lift up to God those who are victims of the violence that seems to be so rampant, not only overseas, but in our nation as well. And Lord, let us remember those who though they have not experienced any physical violence, suffer from the trauma of the events that have occurred around us.
Lord God, as we have lifted up in our hearts these, these names, some of whom we know, some of whom we don't know, Lord, we lift them up because you love them. We lift you up because you loved us and that we now love you as a result of the love that you have poured out on us. Lord, we come today and we ask that that you would be in a place of intercession, that, that somehow or another that, that someone might come to know you, that, that the violence that we're experiencing, that the trauma that we're experiencing might stop. But Lord, we also come today and we come with a spirit of thanksgiving. We come with a spirit of thanksgiving because you allow us to gather as your family in, in this place in this historic place. And it's a sacred place, not, not because of its history, not because of the building, but because you are here and we are here. And, and you said that wherever two or more are gathered in your name, there you'll be present also. Lord, we, we claim that promise today. And Lord, for those that, that wrestle with illnesses of various sorts, the chronic kinds of illnesses, we ask that you, would, that you would be with them, that you would wrap your arms around them. We ask that you would pour out your wisdom and your knowledge into those that, that, that seek for cures for diseases like cancer and, and ALS and, and all of the other lupus and all of the other debilitating diseases that, that so seem to ravage our bodies. Lord, we know that there'll come a day when there will be no more disease. But our prayer is that that might be sooner than later. Lord, we come today and we pray for those who lead us, those who lead us in the world, those who lead us on the national scene, those who lead us locally. We pray for those who lead the church that they might be on your agenda and not on their own. Lord, we come today, we lift up those in, in our hearts who we know wrestle with things. We lift up those who may be victims of self-inflicted addiction and ask that they might know that the freedom from that addiction comes from you, from turning their lives over. Lord, there's so many things that we pray for we come with petitions. We also come with thanksgivings. Lord, we ask these things. And we pray now those words that, that you taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Listen to those words in that song, and it occurs to me that, as Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, that they may not have felt that the cross was so wonderful. So let us hear what Paul writes to this church in Corinth. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. 
Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were noble. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that as it is written, let no one who boasts boast in the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our Thursday morning men's group is studying a book entitled Practicing the Way. The book begins with the question, who are you following? It then makes the assertion that everybody is following somebody or at least something. The author continues, put another way, we're all disciples. The question isn't, am I a disciple? It's who or what am I a disciple of? The idea that we are disciples means that we are constantly in the process of becoming something different than what we are today. We are constantly being formed. I'd like to take the author's thought a step further because I believe that in the complexity of the world in, in which we live, the fact of the matter is that it's not one somebody or one something, but in this process of being formed, we make trade-offs. We become hybrids based on the some ones and the some things that we choose to follow. Think about it this way. I'm sure that if I were to go and ask you out here, there would be some of you who would say that we're Democrats. There are some of you who would say we're Republicans. There are some of you who would say we're Libertarians. And there are some of you who would say, we don't know what we are, we're independents. As we go a step further and we follow those, they, whatever political entity we choose to follow helps form who we are. How we are, who we are employed by also helps to become a forming factor in who we are. I would submit to you that a, a long-term employee of Chick-fil-A has a different set of values than a long-term employer employee of McDonald's. They don't open on Sunday, but Subway does. Let me sum up the thought by saying that the culture in which we live has much to do with who we are becoming. Along those lines, the assumption that's often made is that there are only two ways for us to engage our culture, to engage the culture of the world in which we live. We can either become protective and isolate ourselves, or we can assimilate and become just like the world. However, what Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John is that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. 
in the world, but not of the world. In other words, we're not called to isolate ourselves from the culture in which we live by day to day, or to over-adapt, to assimilate into the culture in which we live. Instead, we are called as disciples of Christ Jesus to be a countercultural alternative to bring about the society of God's people, to be a light in the world and to be the salt of the earth. Let us understand that separation and assimilation, isolation and absorption are dual dangers that are equal threats to the gospel. As we look at our scripture this morning, Paul is writing to a group of believers in Corinth who are facing this same tension, the same tension that we as Christians face today. And it's instructive for us to understand the parallels between what is happening to the church in Corinth in the first century AD and what is happening in the church in the world today. Let me see if any of this sounds familiar. Imagine a church racked by division. Imagine a church where powerful leaders promote themselves against each other. Each have their own set of disciples, their own set of believers who follow them. Believers sue each other in secular courts. It's a church that wrestles with issues of morality. There are disagreements about the role of men and women in the church. There are racial differences, Jews and Gentiles, and that's still all that we have. Either you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. Corinth is a culture of haves and have-nots, of the educated and the uneducated, causing the Corinthian church to deal with issues of what today we would refer to as social justice. There are significant numbers of immature and some not so immature Christians who don't even believe in the resurrection of Christ. Let me ask you the question, does that sound like anything that we might be experiencing in the world today? I submit to you that if you change the date to 2024 and the name of the church, the story becomes very familiar. So let's understand the culture. This is a culture in Corinth that values wisdom and power. When they thought of wisdom, they were primarily concerned with gaining intellectual knowledge that could be leveraged for the purpose of attaining influence and power. Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom then, was viewed as a tool for achieving self-gain. It's a culture that values wealth and status. It's a polytheistic culture. There were temples there to the Greco-Roman gods and, and goddesses like Alcipius and, and Aphrodite. And I understand that there were some thousand slaves and prostitutes in the temple of Aphrodite. The divisions in the Corinthian church indicate that they were finding purpose and value in their lives from the culture in which they lived rather than from the gospel. And it begs the question, why should we be concerned with their cultural storyline, the storyline of a church that existed some 2,000 years ago? Based on what we've shared, I submit to you that one reason is that there's a significant resonance between the storyline of Corinth and the church at Corinth and the cultural storyline in most cities and most churches today. That's significant because there's a significant dissonance between the storyline of the commonality in that time, the storyline of our time, and the storyline of the gospel. Just as the Corinthian believers had their blind spots and unwittingly absorbed beliefs and values from their culture, so do we. What Paul is doing is helping us recognize some of our own blind spots. Let me submit to you 
that their storyline is our storyline. If you were to sum up the cultural storyline of the United States, you might say something similar to what we've said about Corinth. Wisdom, knowledge, intellect, and education are the primary cultural elements of our society. Accomplishment, read that, success, is measured in terms of money, position, and power. At the end of the day, we respect those who have made it. It begs the question, are we achievement addicts? Who are we? How do we calibrate our worth? What does this look like horizontally? What happens when we achieve? What happens when we perform? What happens when we grab? What happens when we pursue? Have we allowed this storyline to replace the storyline of the gospel in our lives? You see, our text today creates an uncomfortable tension when it calls us to a storyline that is different from the one that we live in every day and have absorbed. The Apostle Paul challenges us to consider the fact that God has a very different understanding of wisdom, knowledge, and power than we do. Paul's words flip the common cultural storyline on its head. In this passage that we have shared today, Paul tells us, for since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ. We preach Christ and him crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser, the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You see, this is, this is the message of the cross. It's the message that God calls us to use to rewrite the cultural storyline. Think about this. Paul lets us know that, that he is writing to us as well as the Corinthians. A few verses earlier, it says this, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. And here's the punchline. Together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. You know, I, 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 this is something that I really like about the scripture is that, that it's timeless. It meets us where we are. It's as relevant today as it was yesterday and it will be as relevant tomorrow as it is today. If I were to ask any of you to develop a scenario that would bride our freedom from sin and death, I'm confident that, that none of you would come up with the answer that, that God came up with. I want you to think about this, you know. I'm sure that you wouldn't come to me and say, this person that's going to save you from sin, this person that's going to be your Messiah, is somebody that Chad tried to defend in a trial and he was convicted and taken off to, to the gas chamber or to the electric chair down somewhere down there at the center in, what is it, Jonesboro? Clayton County, somewhere down there. And that's the one that, no, no, you would not come up with that as a solution. But here's, here's the answer, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. If the common storyline is to be rewritten, it has to be done by someone who is outside of us. None of us is wise enough or powerful enough to rewrite the brokenness of this story. But there is one. Jesus is the one from outside, the Christ, who is the power of God and the wisdom of God, the one who enters the common cultural storyline and turns wisdom upside down. Cultural wisdom says, take care of self first. Don't serve others above self. But Jesus did. 
Cultural wisdom says don't give up position, but Jesus did. Cultural wisdom says don't give up power, but Jesus did. By this great foolish wisdom, Jesus has rewritten the storyline. He has redefined wisdom and power as we know them. And the work of the cross is the most powerful expression of that upside down picture. I began this morning by sharing that we're all disciples of someone or something. In the scripture that we shared this morning, Paul tells us that there are ultimately only two groups of disciples. Those who see the message of the cross as foolishness and are perishing. And those who see the message of the cross as the power of God and are being saved. I can say hallelujah this morning because you are those who, who understand the message of the cross as the power of God and are being saved. You are those. For you, the message of the cross is the power of God. For you, my brothers and sisters, the message of the cross is the message of God's love. The cross of Jesus is the place where the greatest paradox ever, ever posed, the greatest paradox ever posed is resolved. You see, it's at the cross of Jesus where justice and grace come together. I love the way Horatio Spafford says it in the hymn, It is well with my soul. Hear his words, my sin, oh my sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. You see, it's, it's in the nailing of Jesus to the cross that the justice is satisfied, that the truth is satisfied, and it's the grace that flows from the cross that allows us not to bear our sin anymore. My brothers and sisters, I, I leave you with this thought this morning. Let us be Christ's disciples. Paul, in one case, says we need to be Christ's ambassadors let us be Christ's ambassadors. We live in a world that needs to experience this rewritten storyline. This storyline that, that allows the foolishness of God to triumph over the wisdom of the world. Let us, through the power of God's Holy Spirit, let God use us in rewriting the storyline. The message of the cross, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being, those who are perishing. But to you, but to you who are being saved, the message of the cross is the power of God. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for the one who hung on Calvary's cross. That your justice might be satisfied. And that the blood that was poured out washes our sins away. Lord, help us to survey the wondrous cross. The wondrous cross where the Lord so divine poured out his blood. We ask these things, we lift these prayers up, we do it in Christ's name. And God's children all said, Amen. Let us stand and sing together now verses 1, 4, and 5 of the church's one foundation.
face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his peace now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. 